Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Search Crack uh, at Apache Con Home 2020. Uh, today, we have with us Shubhra Roy from Box. Uh, he's been working on enterprise search and data discovery for the past eight years and is currently involved in building infrastructure components that enable millions of users to find relevant content uh, stored in Box. Shubhra will be talking about improving search availability by striving for more lines. Uh, I'm looking forward to learning more about measuring and improving uh, the availability and getting a peek under the hood of Box Search. Uh, over to you, Shubhra. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this talk today. Uh, sorry, let me turn off uh, my speaker. Sorry, I was getting feedback. Uh, so welcome to this. Uh, talk today on improving search availability. Uh, I'm Shubro, and I work as a staff engineer on the Box Search team. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Box, uh, it is a cloud content management platform that enables uh, users to securely share content and uh, collaborate on content. platform sits uh, box search, which uh, uh, users to find relevant content. Uh, at its core, we power this using Apache Solar, but we also use a lot of other Apache technologies uh, in our stack. Uh, the index is over uh, 800 uh, terabytes, and it contains hundreds of billions of files. And uh, these um, uh, files, or the index, is growing by millions of files each day. So uh, today's talk is uh, going to be about failures uh, and the kind of failures that happen in systems, but more importantly, how we can improve uh, our availability in the presence of these failures. Uh, so we are going to be talking about how to measure search availability, or what does availability mean even for a system like search? Uh, and then uh, we'll move on to talking about how to improve um, fault tolerance, how to uh, improve our availability using failure detection and automated recovery and uh, some failure prevention strategies. So uh, let's move on to uh, measuring search availability. Um, Generally, uh, systems availability is measured uh, in terms of uh, the percentage of downtime it has over uh, the entire agreed service time. Uh, for a cloud platform like Box, the agreed service time is basically 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, right? Uh, and 365 days a year. So uh, it boils down to uh, measuring uh, downtime. So what do we mean exactly by downtime of a system? Is it simply the number of outage minutes that uh, you have? Or is it uh, also about how um, we um, look at partial failures or uh, latency or um, the quality of results? Uh, and then uh, it's not just a single solar cluster that we are looking at, but we are also talking about the availability of this entire system. Uh, which con contains multiple components. Uh, it, it has multiple uh, services that need to talk to each other, each having their own failure domains, uh, each fail differently, and those failures affect uh, other services. So how do we measure the system, uh, the availability of this entire system and not just a single component? And when we are measuring availability of a system like this, uh, what is important is uh, to not fall into this trap of measuring uh, something within the system using, uh, say, an internal ping uh, to solar uh, to see if the solar cluster is available. Uh, because that metric can lie to us. Uh, maybe the solar cluster is doing fine, but uh, somewhere upstream there is an issue in the indexing pipeline because of which we are not indexing any new documents. Or maybe there is a bug on the query side because of which we are returning empty results to the user. So uh, it basically means the users are unhappy, but our metrics are telling us that the availability is great. So it is important to measure the availability from the user's perspective, because at the end of the day, that is what we are trying to measure, right? 
so in that aspect, uh, at Box, we uh, measure availability by defining something called a bad minute. Uh, a bad minute is basically a minute in which we return more than 1% of errors to users out of uh, the total number of requests we got in that minute. And then uh, availability is basically defined as uh, the total number of bad minutes uh, that we have in any measurement period. Now, this could be a week, a month, a quarter, or a year. Uh, and then uh, when we are measuring availability, it is important to measure it continuously uh, in a stable manner. So to do this, uh, we store all the responses that we return to users uh, and uh, in an analytic system uh, based on S3 uh, and build Hive tables on top of it. So you can run uh, Hive queries to generate a report at the end of the quarter for your availability. But we also update this information in Wavefront so we can build dashboards like you can see on the right, uh, which help us uh, continuously monitor availability and then uh, we can address if there are any availability issues that are happening. Uh, so now that we understand how to measure availability, uh, let's look at what it exactly depends on. So obviously it depends on uh, the network communications uh, or uh, the network that exists between services. So uh, services need to talk to each other. And if there is a network partition, then it is going to hamper your availability. Uh, it also depends on the actual machines that the software is running on and the operating system, which is managing the file system, uh, the um, uh, uh, internal caches, uh, the processes that are running on that machine, and any issues on this layer is going to cause issues. Uh, and finally, it depends on the application software, which is uh, either like Solar or Lucene or Elasticsearch or uh, even your own services that you have written on top of these uh, to build a search system. Uh, in today's talk, uh, we'll mainly focus on this uh, application software and things we can do in this layer to improve our availability by tolerating failure in the lower three layers. And uh, towards the end, I'll talk about the two pillars that you see, which is the processes that we use to manage uh, search and the people that are involved in uh, managing search. And there are things that we can do even at this layer to significantly improve our availability. Uh, so now let's uh, move on to look at uh, some suggestions or strategies that we can actually use uh, to improve availability by tolerating faults in the system. Uh, the first one is uh, most commonly used by everyone, which is adding more redundancy. Uh, you can have a cluster in a single availability zone, and if it goes down, then you're completely unavailable. Uh, the idea is to add more replicas uh, in different availability zones. Uh, and by availability zone, I mean uh, maybe data centers which are geo-distributed in such a way so that uh, power failure in one data center doesn't affect the other. Or this could be uh, regions in uh, public cloud like GCP or AWS, so one region failure doesn't impact clusters in another region. And uh, this is a great way to um, handle availability issues. Uh, what is important here is to pick a routing strategy. So either you can have an active passive routing strategy where you always send the queries to an active cluster. And in case of uh, an issue, you fail over to the passive one. Uh, the other one is a more active active uh, strategy where uh, you can uh, fan out all your queries to all the active clusters. And this works well if you have a query heavy uh, application like search, uh, so you can get better load balancing. And then if there is a failure on one of the clusters, uh, you can simply fail over the traffic to one of the other clusters. Now, what is important here is to ensure that you have enough compute capacity on each of the clusters to take additional traffic when a cluster fails, because otherwise you can have a cascading failure where you fail over the traffic to, uh, uh, to another active cluster and that gets overwhelmed and that fails and so on and so forth. So that is something important to keep in mind. Uh, next, uh, look, let's look at an individual cluster. So far, we uh, looked at how we can add redundancy at the cluster level, uh, but we can do something at individual clusters uh, to improve our availability or at least improve our chances of being partially available by sharding our index. So irrespective of uh, the size of uh, the index, uh, we should always try to shard our index into smaller shards and then allocate uh, dedicated resources to them, either in terms of processes or uh, assigning them to a specific machine so that uh, when a single machine goes down, your cluster doesn't uh, become unavailable. 
So uh, at Box, we uh, assign shards to machines in such a way that uh, a single machine going down doesn't uh, make more than 1% of our index unavailable. So we still can serve requests from 99% of uh, the index. And then later in the presentation, we'll talk about how to handle that 1% failure when uh, a machine actually fails. Right. Uh, there are a couple of uh, ways uh, to shard. There is a vertical sharding where uh, you basically can shard your index uh, based on some attribute of the index. Uh, let's say you could split the index into a title, document title index, uh, content index, and then uh, uh, metadata index. And then if you have any failures, then uh, you can simply uh, uh, return results from your uh, title index if your content index has failed. So your quality of search goes down a little, but you're still highly available. Uh, the other one is horizontal partitioning, where you basically partition your index based on a sharding key, which could be either hash or range partitioning. Uh, and it is also uh, possible to use a combination of these, like you can vert vertically partition your index and then uh, horizontally partition uh, those vertical partitions. Uh, so uh, it is important, though, to pick a sharding strategy that really suits your application and uh, matches your query pattern. Otherwise, you can have availability issues just because of a bad sharding scheme. Uh, and what a great example of this is something we actually saw at Box a couple of years back um, when we were sharding using a hash-based partitioning of the file ID. And what we saw happen was that uh, because uh, we were doing hash-based partitioning on the file ID, we were randomly distributing the documents across the shard, uh, which meant that at query time, we needed to fan out the query to every single shard. What happens then is uh, you're bottlenecked by the slowest shard. So if you can see the latency graphs on the right, uh, at the bottom right, you see the shard level latency. And even if a couple of shards have a latency spike, every single query going to the whole cluster saw a huge latency spike, which led to timeouts and uh, returned bad responses or uh, timeout exceptions to the user. Uh, it also meant that the cluster was very susceptible to uh, any user doing high throughput queries because now that was getting fanned out to every single shard and uh, single shard failures just made the cluster unusable. So the way we address this is we changed our partitioning scheme to use a range partition uh, and used enterprise ID to partition so that uh, we distributed the documents uh, by enterprise. And now we can only fan out the query to those shards that contain documents from that enterprise. Uh, this uh, worked well for us. Uh, and we saw that our P95 query latency went down significantly and uh, now a single shard going down only impacts those users or those enterprises that uh, need the data from that shard. Um, and we don't have uh, entire cluster issues. So this is one example where actually modifying your sharding scheme uh, can help you improve your availability. Other things to think about on, uh, when it comes to sharding is uh, hotspotting. This is a common thing that happens uh, in case of sharding, especially if you have some hotkeys. Uh, a great example of this is, say, if you're building video search and uh, you have music videos of uh, Lady Gaga, for example, and uh, that is uh, something which is very popular. And if you put all such documents or all such videos on a single shard, uh, then anyone, then that particular shard is going to get a disproportionate amount of traffic and will be susceptible to going down, causing availability issues. Uh, so a great way to handle this is to do sorting, which is uh, you add a few random bits uh, to the beginning of your sharding key, which uh, distributes us more evenly across multiple shards. And you can actually control the, the fan out or the distribution here by picking the number of bits that you use. So uh, you can use a three bit uh, salt and that will ensure that you are uh, spreading uh, your sharding key across uh, eight shards. Uh, you can still have hotspotting issues uh, even after salting, uh, especially if you're assigning multiple shards to a single machine and you end up assigning all the Lady Gaga shards to a same machine. Or let's say you assign uh, the Lady Gaga shard and the Britney Spears shard to the same machine. So what that means is now uh, you have uh, hotspotting at the machine level. And this can be equally bad because the machine is bound by the compute resources it has, right? Uh, so. Uh, a good way to handle this is using bin packing. Uh, bin packing is an optimization algorithm that uh, uh, signs uh, elements into buckets, uh, which can be shards to machines, in such a way that it can optimize some parameter. And in this case, you can pick QPS as a parameter. 
which will enable you to assign machines, uh, uh, assign shards to machines in such a way that you do not have hot spotting at the machine level. Uh, another thing to think about is handling index growth. Uh, this is something we saw at Box once we moved to enterprise-based sharding, uh, which is uh, some shards uh, started growing exponentially compared to others because uh, those enterprises grow much faster and uh, upload larger number of documents. Uh, but eventually, the shards are bounded by the physical uh, disk resource of the machine. Uh, so eventually, some shards are going to run out of disk space, and you need to handle that. So uh, one way of doing that is uh, to do shard splitting. This is something that HBase does. Uh, you can split the shard into a smaller uh, range, and then you can move one of the uh, split shards to a different machine, giving more room to the machine where you ran out of disk. Uh, unfortunately, this does involve moving physical bytes to a different machine, uh, which can be expensive, especially if your shards are large. Uh, the alternative is to use something called shard spilling that we use at Box. Uh, which means uh, if your shard exceeded a particular threshold of size, then you can spill over the requests uh, going to that shard to another shard on, this, uh, on a different machine which has more headroom or capacity. This uh, complicates your routing logic a little, but it can save you uh, the time to actually move the physical bytes of uh, the shard. Uh, and then finally, uh, we always need to think about uh, organic growth. So as your index grows, you're going to add more machines and scale your cluster. Uh, but if your sharding strategy involves a static mapping of shards to machines, then uh, it would mean every time you scale your cluster, you would need to uh, rebuild your shard boundaries and assign your shards again, which can involve downtiming your system. Uh, if your availability cannot handle something like that, then uh, a good option is to use virtual partitioning where you uh, create a large number of shards and then use something like consistent hashing or ring hash uh, to assign these shards to machines in such a way that you don't have to modify your shard boundaries or your shard assignment mapping. Uh, it'll uh, be agnostic to that and automatically handle uh, increasing machines in a cluster. So uh, that brings us uh, to uh, another strategy which is really useful in avoiding failures, which is uh, retries. Uh, if you have a system like this, which has a large number of services that are talking to each other, then uh, a great way uh, to avoid uh, network packet drops or intermittent failures at each uh, service is to retry the request at each layer. Uh, one thing to remember, though, is retries can be overwhelming. So one thing uh, that we have seen at Box is if a solar shard, for example, is having intermittent issues and failing some requests, and the upstream service is continuously retrying these requests, then uh, it can actually create a retry storm that uh, takes down your entire cluster. And uh, that that is really bad. And uh, the way we handle it is we always use uh, exponential back off when retrying so that uh, we are giving more and more time to the downstream system to recover uh, when we do the next retry. And uh, it is also important to use uh, something called a jitter or a random wait so that if you have multiple instances which are retrying, uh, you do not uh, somehow end up synchronizing the retry so that you are uh, retrying at the same time. Uh, and this can save you again from co-causing a uh, retry storm. Uh, finally, we should only try to retry uh, failures that you can recover from, like uh, timeout exceptions, gateway timeouts, and things like that. Uh, we should never try to retry a solar exception or um, maybe a 400, because uh, those are things that we can't uh, recover from. Uh, another strategy that we use at Box uh, is optimistic retries. So we talked about having multiple replicas in the beginning uh, and distributing uh, them in a more active-active way. So uh, if you have multiple clusters that are serving traffic in active-active uh, fashion, then you can send your queries to more than one cluster and then simply return the result from the one that returns the fastest and cancel the other query. Uh, what this does is uh, it saves you from waiting for a failure to happen and then retry to multiple clusters, by which time maybe your query has already timed out at the topmost layer and you've returned a 500 to the user. So uh, this is possible if you have available compute on uh, your clusters and you have that uh, headroom to absorb the additional query that you do. Uh, but it is also important uh, to uh, realize that we need to time out requests uh, at the cluster level in such a way that we are not wasting compute resources uh, at the cluster by processing queries that have already timed out. Uh, 
So for example, if you have, uh, in, uh, if you look at this figure on the right, if you have a web app layer where you start a query with a timeout of 10 seconds, then at the federator layer, maybe you just have nine seconds left. And then uh, the query service, you have five uh, seconds left because maybe you spend some time doing retries. And then eventually at the solar cluster level, uh, you have only four seconds left. But if you use a static timeout of 10 seconds at every layer, then you've wasted six seconds of processing time on the solar cluster, processing a query that has already timed out at the web app layer. So this is a wasteful consumption of compute resources, which can be dedicated to processing other queries that go to that cluster. Uh, so uh, in this aspect also, uh, a time allowed parameter that is provided by solar is a great way to push down uh, the query timeout that you computed all the way to solar. And this parameter is then evaluated at the end of uh, the query expansion phase and the document collection phase. So uh, it will allow solar to time out the query if it has exceeded the time allowed parameter that you passed. And uh, at Box, we have seen that this parameter is uh, really useful in timing out expensive queries at the solar level. So you can avoid uh, processing queries which are expensive, and that can help you uh, really recover from uh, these kind of issues. Uh, that brings us to the next section on uh, failure detection and recovery. So, so far, we have talked about how failures will happen uh, and how we can tolerate them. In this section, we'll talk about some ways we can detect failures in our system and try to recover from them without human intervention. Uh, so one way to do this is using circuit breakers. Uh, this is a common uh, software uh, pattern which is used to detect uh, issues in a downstream system and uh, trip a circuit breaker, which can stop requests going to the faulty downstream system. Uh, in case of search uh, or say solar shards, uh, the way we can do this is detect failures based on uh, you know, failures return, detect issues based on failures returned from the solar shard, or we can uh, monitor the P95 latency of a specific shard. And if it is much higher than uh, the other shards uh, that we are querying, then we can trip the circuit breaker and stop sending queries to the faulty shard and uh, handle this by rerouting the queries to an alternate replica, which is going uh, to another cluster. Uh, also, once the system has recovered, we can close the circuit breaker and that resumes the normal uh, flow of traffic. A uh, problem here though is that uh, we are using failures or latencies uh, to detect failures uh, in the downstream system. Uh, and that means we are already uh, returning 500s or high latency queries back to the user. And so basically we are detecting failure at the expense of the user. Uh, so an alternative here is to uh, use health monitoring systems. So we can uh, monitor the health of shards uh, using health checks. Uh, some health checks that uh, you can use for solar is the solar pin query. That's a great uh, way to detect if your solar uh, process is up and running. Uh, you can also use, uh, 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 you can also try to index an empty document uh, to solar to make sure that uh, the uh, indexing is working. You can gather stats at the machine level like CPU and uh, memory uh, disk utilization to look at the machine and ensure that the machine that is running the solar shard is uh, doing well. And uh, based on these health checks, you can determine whether your uh, downstream system or shard uh, is in a healthy state, uh, which can help uh, trigger a circuit breaker. So uh, at Box, we have built um, uh, something called a shard health, shard health monitor. Uh, this is uh, uh, a Kubernetes services uh, that uh, runs uh, multiple health checks to all solar shards uh, that are serving live user traffic. And whenever there are failures uh, for multiple health checks on a specific shard, um, the shard health monitor notifies this information to Zookeeper. Uh, and then any service that needs to talk to these clusters registers watchers in Zookeeper on that particular Z node. And that makes Zookeeper send a notification to these services saying uh, that a particular shard uh, is uh, having trouble, which then uh, trips the circuit breaker in these services and stops sending requests to the faulty shard and reroutes them to a different cluster. Uh, on the flip side, once the shard recovers, Shard Health Monitor can detect this and update Zookeeper, which then again notifies these services to close their circuit breakers and uh, start sending requests back to the original shard. 
So this is an example of an end-to-end system that you can build using the circuit breaker pattern uh, with a health monitoring system and a notification system like Zookeeper uh, to have end-to-end -end failure detection and automated recovery without requiring human intervention. And this will take you a long way in getting close to that uh, three nines or four nines of availability because uh, now your uh, reaction time or recovery time is much, is much faster than a human being trying to uh, log in and pull a shard out of a cluster. Uh, another thing that we haven't talked about so far is uh, uh, the recovery of an index. So sometimes failures can happen which make your index unusable. Uh, you know, this could be an index corruption or a hard machine failure. Uh, in such case, the only option is to rebuild the index, uh, which is really expensive to do from scratch, especially if your shards are really large. Uh, so one option here is to maintain an offline backup of uh, the index uh, in a secondary system. And uh, this can reduce your recovery time significantly uh, by rebuilding from that offline backup. Uh, the way we do it at Box is uh, we uh, use HBase for this and we store solar documents in uh, HBase in a denormalized form. So uh, when a shard goes down, uh, we can simply run a MapReduce job to scan all the documents uh, from HBase that belong to that shard and uh, re index them. Uh, HBase is also great at performing time range scans. So if we have to perform partial failures, uh, we can just run a time range scan for a day or a week and only index those documents uh, from that time period, uh, which can help with the partial recovery. Uh, one problem here is though that we are still re-indexing the documents to solar and indexing is an expensive process. So if you have uh, large shards, then uh, this can uh, really have a large recovery time. So one idea here is to maintain an offline index uh, like HBase and then rebuild uh, segment files uh, in an ongoing manner uh, periodically and store them in an object store like S3 or uh, GCS. And then when you need to rebuild a shard, uh, then instead of re-indexing the documents, you can simply copy these segment files from this object store into the machine and then uh, replay all uh, the latest updates from a system like Kafka uh, based on the last offset that was processed by the segment file generation. So this is an example of an end-to-end -end system that can help you recover uh, the index in case uh, the index is unusable uh, with very low recovery time. Uh, that brings us uh, to our last section today on uh, failure prevention. So far, we have talked about how uh, failures will always happen and how we can detect and recover from them. Uh, but there are some kinds of failures uh, that uh, we can actually prevent or some failure uh, sources that we can actually prevent, uh, thereby improving our uh, availability. The first one is uh, abusive users. So we cannot predict the way users are going to use our system and there are gonna be some ways that they try to use it, which is gonna be abusive. Uh, especially at Box, we've seen uh, sometimes people can perform API queries which are trying to crawl the index, uh, which is like uh, really expensive. And uh, if you're trying to crawl uh, our entire index, it's gonna cause issues uh, for other users who are uh, querying the same shard. So a great way to do uh, prevent this is using different kinds of rate limiters. Uh, they are a great way to prevent uh, abusive queries. It is important to use different kinds of rate limiters. So uh, at Box, we use a global rate limiter on the entire throughput, but we also use rate limiting at uh, the user and enterprise level so that we can prevent uh, specific shards from having issues when they receive a high throughput of queries, um, uh, but still under the global rate limit. Uh, another kind of rate limiting that we use is the index rate limiting. So we have seen that uh, sometimes when we are onboarding a large enterprise or uh, when a user is indexing a lot of large documents, this can be expensive because uh, Solar needs to update a large amount of uh, the inverted index. So uh, a great way to prevent this is to limit uh, requests based on the bytes written uh, to Solar. And uh, when we fail the request uh, due to the rate limiting, instead of failing, uh, it entirely, we simply requeue the request back into Kafka with a uh, back off time so that uh, it can be uh, re-indexed later. So in this way, we can actually smooth uh, indexing spike uh, by tolerating some uh, high latency for indexing that document, but we save uh, Solar from having issues. Uh, 
The other option is uh, the other rate limiting that we use is uh, expensive query rate limiter. So there are uh, certain queries that can be expensive for Solar to process, uh, like a deep offset uh, pagination query or queries uh, with large number of tokens or large number of stock words or uh, a very large filter query can be really expensive. And if you have one too many of these uh, queries in a small succession of time, go to the same shard. Uh, it can strain the shard and fail other requests that are going to uh, that particular shard. So we detect these queries based on the latency of the query and uh, try to prevent future queries uh, for in the next period of time uh, to prevent it causing issues in the downstream system. Uh, another issue that we have seen with uh, solar is if you suddenly overwhelm it with live traffic, uh, then it can have issues and sometimes can crash the solar process. Uh, this happens because uh, your caches, like the filter cache and the document cache, uh, they are all cold and uh, um, suddenly being overwhelmed with a large amount of traffic can cause uh, failures. So the way we address this is uh, whenever we have a backup cluster, we warm it up with live queries. Uh, we have a service called the shadow service, which is responsible for replaying these queries to the backup cluster and uh, keeping it warm. And uh, it also ramps up the traffic slowly so that it doesn't overrun the shard uh, or the cluster entirely. And then uh, we always have a warmed up backup cluster so that uh, when we have an issue with a live cluster, we can swap in the backup cluster, which is already warmed up. And it does not have uh, issues with latency or does not go down when it receives the live user traffic. Uh, and in that uh, respect, it's always good to warm up, uh, uh, to run a few warm up queries for every service, even your own services, because you can have internal caches in those services. You can have uh, thread pools, which take time to initialize, or you can have lazy initializations of other systems internally. Uh, and then if you don't warm up, then the first query that goes to that service pays the cost of initializing everything, uh, which can cause failures every time you deploy or uh, do a rolling restart of a service. So uh, that lastly brings us to the operational aspects of search. Uh, this is uh, the process and the people pillars that I talked about. Uh, there are things that we can do uh, on the operational side to improve uh, search. Uh, the first one is if you have a large monolithic service, it's always a good idea to split it into uh, single responsibility services. This uh, separates the failure domains and makes your service more debuggable in case of issues. Uh, you should invest in uh, monitoring and alerting. Uh, I can't tell you how many issues I've seen, uh, which happened because we lacked a monitoring uh, or visibility into the state of the system, which could have been an early indicator before a cascading figure happened. Um, in general, investing in automation and tooling around running a search can be really helpful in building confidence of running the system. Uh, a good example of this is investing in a good CI CD pipeline, which has inbuilt uh, performance testing so that every time you release uh, something into uh, for uh, into production, you run your performance tests and integration tests and ensure that you're not releasing bad code. Uh, finally, failures will always happen, but it is important to learn from them. Uh, most of the things that I've talked about today have been uh, lessons learned from uh, postmortems that we have done uh, and then remediations that have implemented to improve our uh, availability. Um, Find, uh, finally, we should also document uh, recovery procedures for standard failures, like what happens, uh, what to do when a shard goes down, or what to do when a user is querying us at a very high throughput. Uh, we should document these procedures in runbooks, which are available to the on call, and then it can save you precious minutes when an issue is actually happening. And then lastly, uh, it's great if you can simulate failures in your system before they actually happen. This can test your uh, um, uh, tools that you have built to handle these failures. A good example of this is Chaos Monkey that was built by Netflix. Uh, you can do something like that on your end by taking shards offline intermittently or causing network partitions, and this can help you uh, test your uh, measures to improve availability. So uh, that brings me to the end of my talk today. Uh, hopefully, I was able to give you uh, some tools and uh, suggestions that you can further look into uh, when you're trying to improve uh, the availability uh, posture of your services, uh, and especially search. Uh, thanks again for your time, and uh, I'm open to any questions that you have at this time. Uh, also, a box is always uh, looking for great engineers. So if these problems excite you, then uh, hit me up and we can talk more about uh, opportunities at Box. Thank you.
Uh, so I see uh, someone posted on the chat, uh, is shard health, uh, is the shard health monitor available to all? Is, uh, uh, is this like, is it open source or? Uh... Uh, no, the, the shard of monitor monitor is not something that is open source. Uh, uh, if we we try to contribute uh, things back into uh, the open source community, uh, but we haven't gotten around to uh, making Shard of Monitor open source. But uh, thanks for the suggestion. We'll uh, look into uh, making uh, Shard of Monitor an open source thing that is available to all. Uh, so I see another question here uh, saying, if I'm not mistaken, Solar has inbuilt warm-up at, at least for caches. Would you say it is uh, not enough? So what we have uh, seen is um, that uh, warming up uh, Solar using uh, static queries or uh, fixed uh, set of queries uh, does not represent the actual user traffic that you are getting. So on top of like any inbuilt setup that you have for warming up the caches, it's always a good idea to warm up a solar cluster at the amount of traffic that the cluster will get uh, with uh, the queries that are, you are seeing in the live system. This ensures that you're correctly warming up solar and making it accustomed to uh, the throughput and also the kind of queries or the kind of filter queries that, uh, that you get from the live system. Uh, and that can be helpful in uh, preventing failures. Uh, so another question that I see is uh, how time allowed parameter can help in case of prevention. So uh, time allowed is uh, a parameter that lets you uh, time out a query. So uh, the prevention that it does is if you have an expensive query and it's going to, and we have seen these queries, these are like index crawling queries or deep pagination queries, which can run for hours on your index. And when the query is running on that system, then this will uh, strain the specific shard on solar and any other query going to that uh, shard is going to cause failures. So if you uh, pass a time allowed parameter, which possibly can time, uh, time out the query at the query expansion stage, uh, if, it is a, if it has a large filter query or time it out before document collection, then it can uh, um, basically stop the query before it runs over that shard and it can stop it from failing other queries that go to the shard, which will help improve your work. Uh, so I, I think we are almost out of time, but uh, if you guys have uh, more questions, you can join the Slack channel for the session and uh, you can ask me more questions. Uh, David, I see you have a question there uh, uh, regarding uh, building solar segments offline. Uh, so it'll take me some time to answer this. So if you want to connect one-on-one uh, -on -one or we can uh, take this up on uh, the Slack channel. Uh, this is something we are currently working on as well. So uh, we, we can discuss this more.
So I, I see another question from Matt. Uh, Matt, if you're still there, uh, I can answer it here, or you can ask me again on the Slack channel. Uh, the question is, is the short spelling mechanism a part of your offline indexer, or was that just for routing traffic? So uh, the short spelling mechanism is uh, part of our uh, live index process, So uh, or the live system, actually, not the offline indexer. So. Uh, whenever uh, our index uh, threshold is exceeded by a specific shard, uh, we initiate a shard spilling mechanism, which updates uh, the routing logic uh, for the index as well as the query side. And then uh, we use Zookeeper to update this information to uh, all the services that need this information for routing so that they can uh, update their routing tables and accordingly route requests to the spilled shard instead. Uh, or uh, query both the spill shard and the uh, original shard. Uh, so I, I see another uh, uh, question. If a query is running for more than 30 minutes, uh, how to find out which component uh, is consuming more time? So this is a very good question. Uh, a great way uh, to address something like this is uh, to invest in tracing and uh, uh, locking. So uh, the way we do this is uh, whenever a query enters our uh, system, we assign it uh, a, a trace ID, and then uh, using that, we can trace uh, the queries, the query all through the lifetime of the query. Uh, so uh, uh, we can go and look at the logs at uh, every layer, and uh, we can also look our, at our analytic system to see where the query consumed most of its time. So uh, you can look at uh, the logs uh, at the uh, solar level to see how much time solar consumed. Uh, solar returns something called a queue time, which is the amount of time it took. And then uh, for at each of the layers, uh, we also have timers, which uh, time the query. And then these timers are updated to Wavefront. Uh, so we have a dashboard, which also looks at P95 uh, latency breakdown of uh, queries at each component level. So whenever you're having a latency spike uh, live, you can uh, detect which particular component is having issues. Or if it is a specific query, you can trace it uh, using the trace ID in your logs uh, to look at uh, what the issue was. Uh, the next question is, uh, do you have Zookeeper on its own host? Uh, yeah, we run our own Zookeeper uh, cluster, and that's uh, the Zookeeper we use. We don't use the Zookeeper that's internal uh, to Solar. So uh, another question that, that was asked is uh, for uh, solar cloud with real time updates, uh, how to use uh, offline index build. Uh, so I, I don't know uh, about uh, if it is different with uh, solar cloud specifically, uh, but what do you mean? Uh, what I understand is uh, uh, how do we deal with real time updates? Uh, if, if that is your question, then uh, the, the way we handle it is uh, you uh, you have your offline index and your real time updates are being found out uh, to the offline index uh, whenever uh, the uh, updates happen along with your solar clusters and uh, then when you have to build an index offline you have uh, the index builder continuously generating uh, offline segments so you can uh, remember the last offset that you processed in your indexing queue which uh, possibly is through, uh, built on Kafka. Uh, and or some queuing system like that. Uh, and then whatever real-time updates came in uh, since the last offset you processed, uh, you can replay those uh, from the queue, and then your index will be caught up with uh, the uh, current state of uh, the system. And uh, always, like once, once you have downloaded the segments, you have to start replaying the live indexes. Otherwise, you'll uh, continuously play catch up. So, uh, you start consuming from the queue and then uh, replay from a particular offset. Uh, 
Yeah, so Joseph uh, asked, uh, I meant does Zookeeper run on the solar host or uh, does ZK get dedicated hosts? Uh, uh, we uh, do not use, uh, uh, do not run Zookeeper on the solar hosts. Uh, they uh, run on, on separate hosts. All right, uh, I, I think we are uh, really quite out of time. Uh, thank you again uh, for those of you who stayed around and asked more questions. Uh, again, you can ask me more questions on the search Slack channel. Uh, thanks again for your time and uh, have a great day.